Hey guys, and welcome back to our uh, Wednesday night Bible study. And we're continuing uh, this idea of humbling ourselves. We looked at the, our theme passage last week was James chapter four, seven through 10. And it says, submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and let your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. And it is that last aspect that has us looking at this because he tells us as we looked last week that if we try to exalt ourselves, then we will be humbled. But if we humble ourselves, he will be the one uh, that exalts us. And we're going to be looking at this second aspect that, he, that James talks about where it says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. And so let's look at this idea of resisting the devil. Uh, my first reaction to this statement is most, most people believe that they are resisting the devil. Most people believe that they are putting up a fight against Satan and against uh, his lies and against his temptations. Um, but I wonder if we're resisting the devil the same way that we are possibly resisting uh, eating during this quarantine time. Uh, if you're anything like me, you've got little snacks uh, in the house. You may have uh, somebody in your house that's hiding them because they don't want anybody else to eat them. But if you look in the mirror and you sit there and go, man alive, I put on some weight and I need to uh, uh, really get serious uh, about getting back to the weight that I should be at. Why well, at that point in time need to start resisting food? Uh, and the best way for me to resist food at the very beginning is for it not to be in the house, not to have food at the house that I like, not to have stuff there that I enjoy, but to give myself time to where I can fight against that. Um, and I fear that a lot of us are resisting Satan that way, that, that there's things in our lives that we need to push away from, or there's things in our lives that we need to remove from our lives, uh, but we just keep them around because we're okay with a little bit of sin in our life. Um, the second thing I, I think of uh, is I think we misunderstand this idea of Satan fleeing from us. I think we think, oh man, I stood up, I didn't fall into temptation, and Satan should go running for the hills. Um, and we're going to talk about that a little bit towards the end of uh, this Bible study. But I want us to just look at a couple different things. Uh, for us to resist Satan, the first thing I believe that we have to do is we have to admit that we have an enemy. If we want to resist Satan, we have to admit that we have an enemy. John 10.10 10 says this, The thief comes only to kill, steal, and destroy. I have come that you may have life, and you may have it to the abundant. I think so many times we don't think Satan is out to destroy us. I think so many times we don't think Satan is out to kill us um, or to steal from us. I think that we play around with it. I think that we we toy with sin in our lives and we kind of keep it there because, hey, you know what? Nothing is happening to me at this point in time. You've got Moses mentioned in uh, uh, Hebrews 11 where it says that uh, he rejected uh, a pleasure for a short time. He chose to be mistreated with his people instead of receiving the pleasure of Pharaoh's house and Pharaoh's wealth and everything that came with that. But that pleasure is only for a short time. Uh, I had a youth minister who used to say that sin will uh, uh, keep us longer than we want to stay. Has a price higher than we want to pay. And I think that that's so true. The idea that it will keep us longer than we want to stay. Actually, the quote goes like this. Sin will take us further than we want to go. Will keep us longer than we want to stay. And has a price tag higher than we want to pay. We have to admit that that is what Satan wants to do. We have to admit that that is who Satan is. Teams that play down to their competition in sports tend to have problems with that. They underestimate who they are going up against. We cannot underestimate Satan. The second thing is this, though. Satan is good at what he does. We sing the song, Our God is a Lion. The Lion of Judah. Roaring with power and fighting our battles. We love this idea of God being pictured as a lion because there's something about a lion. He's the king of the jungle. He's strong. He's powerful. There's something about that picture that gives us ease. But I want you guys to understand this. In 1 Peter verse, uh, uh, chapter 5, 8 and 9, Peter also describes Satan as a lion. He says, be sober-minded, be watchful, for your adversary, the devil, 
prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him. Stand firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brothers, your brotherhood throughout the world. Guys, I want us to understand this. The devil's goal is not for you to worship him. Okay, the devil's goal is not for you to, to become a Satan worshiper, to become a devil worshiper. The devil's goal is for you not to worship God. And there is a huge difference in between. All he has to do is get you off track a little bit. He doesn't have to derail you. All he has to do is get you to accept good instead of great. The idea that we are told that we should not commit murder. Uh, Jesus tells us that if we're angry with a brother in our heart, we have committed murder in our our heart. There's a huge difference between committing murder in our heart and the idea that I may never physically end someone's life. But Jesus says it's the same concept. Satan is extremely good at what he does. He will lie to us. He will tell you that you are the only one. He will lie to you and he will say everyone else is doing it. He'll use both of them. It's amazing. He is good at what he does and we have to be good at our defense against him. So how do we resist him? The first thing that I would tell us is this. We resist him with godly wisdom. Let's look at the temptations. There's the first two temptations of Christ. Uh, Matthew chapter 4 verse 1 and 3 says this. 1 through 3. Uh, then Jesus was led up by the spirit into the wilderness and tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. Let's stop and think of this temptation. What is wrong with this temptation? Biblically, let's find something in scripture where it says Jesus cannot turn stones into bread. In fact, the first miracle he performed, he turned water into wine. Um, why can't he turn stones into bread? He hasn't eaten for 40 days. He's, he's hungry. Satan's asking, he says, if you're the son of God, maybe it's because he's, he's wanting him to prove himself. I don't know. But you've got to understand, we resist, we resist Satan with godly wisdom. Look at what 1 Corinthians 10, 23 says this. All things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. I, the version I memorized when I was young, it simply said this. All things are permissible, but not all things are beneficial. All things are permissible, but not all things build up. It may have been permissible for Jesus to turn these stones into bread, but it wasn't beneficial. We have to be wise in the decisions that we're making. Just because it's not wrong doesn't mean that it's right. Just because there's no consequence for it doesn't mean that we shouldn't do it. Um, we have to understand the difference between wisdom and knowledge. Just because it's okay to do something doesn't mean that we should do it. And so that was this first thing. Christ had godly wisdom. But not only that, we resist Satan. We resist him with knowledge of God's word. Let's look at the second temptation uh, in Matthew uh, 4, 5 through 7. It says, And the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you're the son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you. And on their hands they will bear you up, lest your foot should strike against a stone. And Jesus said to him, again it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. If we want to resist Satan, we have to have a knowledge of the word of God. We have to have an understanding of the word of God. It's not the same to just know it. There are scholars who know and have the word of God memorized, but don't do anything in the word of God. There are scholars who have the word of God memorized, but truly do not understand what God is trying to say. And I say that because the entire Sermon on the Mount goes against the religious leaders of the day who knew the word of God, but did not have knowledge of the word of God, did not understand the word of God. Satan in this temptation is, is quoting scripture. He says, he will command his angels concerning you on their hands. They will bear you up. Least your foot should strike against a stone. He's quoting scripture to God. He's quoting scripture to Christ, but it's not the original meaning. It's not what God intended with this. 
And so we have to have a knowledge of scripture. Psalm 119, a couple of famous verses in there. One says, I will hide your word in my heart so that I might not sin against you. Hiding that word, understanding that word, and knowing that word. And then it also says, your word is a lamp into my feet and a light into my path. If we want to be able to fight off Satan when he comes at us with half-truths, when we want to be able to fight off Satan, when he comes at us with scripture that just seems not quite right, we have to have an understanding of the word of God. And let's end with this, this idea of him fleeing from us. Let's go back to the passage uh, uh, in 1 Peter where he says, resist him firm in your faith, knowing that at the same, the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your, by your brotherhood throughout the world. Peter doesn't tell us that if we resist Satan that he's going to flee from us. Peter tells us that if we resist, we resist him knowing that we have brothers and sisters doing the same thing throughout the world. And even in the temptations of Christ, Christ, Satan didn't flee from him after the first temptation. He didn't flee from him after the second temptation. I think of this as the idea of lifting weights. The first time you lift weights, if you're going to, if you're going to get under and you're going to start bench pressing, the first time you bench press, man, that weight may seem heavy. But after working out for a couple of weeks, that same weight can easily be lifted. Did the weight go away? No. You got stronger. You were able to sustain that much easier. Yeah, Satan will flee from us. But he's not going to run for the hills just because we say no to him one time. Because his goal is for us to not worship God. I pray that we will seek God's face. I pray that we will resist the devil. And I pray that as we do that, that he would flee from your life. Y'all have a good week.